Thank you. It's so good to be with you all today at the Colombo Network National ELT Conference. My name is David Harrison. I'm a linguist and an anthropologist, and I explore the world's most endangered languages. And I also help with language revitalization projects around the globe. I've also been honored to serve as a National Geographic Explorer. And I want to say on behalf of our whole team at National Geographic Learning, thank you for the vital work you are doing as educators. Most of you are in Colombia. I understand there are about 600 of you attending this meeting, and I truly wish I could be there with you personally. Colombia is a special place for me. I've enjoyed walking around the streets of beautiful Bogota, taking the Teleferico up to Monserrata to look over the city, and of course, your cuisine. I especially like Ayako, your version of chicken soup, and I've always appreciated how patient Colombians are with me when I speak my version of Spanish. I've met some remarkable people in Colombia, people who I would call language warriors, who represent the cultural richness and resilience of Colombians. I'm gonna come back to Colombia at the end of this talk, but first I'd like to take you on a virtual visit around the world to better understand the current state and the importance of language diversity. I'm gonna share my screen now. So I've called my talk a vision of language diversity. And this is in keeping with the theme of the conference, which as you know, is called the power of vision and the future of ELT. I'm going to be talking about my vision of a multilingual world and the value and vision that is provided by language diversity. As I said, I'm a linguist. I travel around the world to remote places. I love my job. I get to meet some of the most amazing people. This is a picture of me in the South Pacific in Vanuatu doing what I do, which is simply sitting down with people listening to their stories, recording their knowledge and their wisdom that they choose to share with me, and building digital tools to help revitalize their languages. There is an immense amount of linguistic diversity in the world. More than 7,000 languages are currently spoken, and we estimate that almost half of these languages are endangered and will not survive this century. So there's a sense of urgency to this work as well. Now, the world's languages are demographically very unevenly distributed. The 83 biggest languages in the world account for about 80% of the world's population. The medium-sized languages, approximately 3,000, account for about 20% of the world's population. And the smallest languages of the world, more than half of the world's languages, are spoken by just 0.1% of the world's population. So we have a very skewed knowledge base, a skewed distribution of the world's linguistic and cultural knowledge. Languages are endangered like species, plants, animals, birds, and fish, but they are much more endangered. And they're connections between these two parallel extinctions. Most of the world species have not yet been documented by zoologists, botanists, and other scientists. Most of the world's languages have not yet been recorded or documented by linguists. Now, when I said that plants and animals have not been documented by scientists, that doesn't mean they're unknown to people. And it turns out that most of the plants and animals in the world are well known to people but people who speak minority, small, endangered languages. And so there's actually a deep connection between biodiversity and linguistic diversity. As we lose languages, we are losing knowledge about plants and animals that are known to people, but are not yet known to science. A few years ago, with help from National Geographic Society, I launched this map. This is the language hotspots map. And it shows those critical areas around the world that are characterized by 
three parameters. The first characteristic of a language hotspot, it has a very, very high diversity of languages. The second characteristic is that it has high levels of language endangerment. And the third characteristic is that it has low levels of language documentation. So where we have many languages, many endangered languages, and little or scanty scientific documentation, we have a language hotspot. This map shows 13. There are actually 24 hotspots that my team and I have identified. And with support from National Geographic, we've been visiting the hotspots, talking with some of the last speakers of the world's most endangered languages, recording their stories, and building digital tools to help them revitalize their languages. So I would like to invite you today to come with me on a virtual tour of the world. We're going to visit three language hotspots. The first one will be in Siberia, where it's usually pretty cold. The second hotspot will be in a place where it's almost always warm. That's the South Pacific in Eastern Melanesia. And the third is a place that for many of you is much closer to home, and that is South America. So we're going to start in a place that's very dear to my heart. It's called Tuva. It's located in South Siberia, next to Mongolia. It's a small nationality. They have about 250,000 people, and most of them are bilingual. So they speak Tuvan, which is their own language, and then they speak Russian, which is the language of the country that colonized them and that they belong to. So most people are bilingual. I first went to Tuva as a young, eager graduate student from Yale University. I went to live with a nomadic family who herded yaks. And this is a picture of me learning the language and learning about the culture. I discovered right away that I had almost no useful skills in a nomadic society. And so one of the jobs I was assigned was to collect yak manure because there is no other source of fuel in this environment. So I had to go out following the yaks, collecting the yak poop, drying it out, processing it, bringing it back to the yurt. And I discovered through that simple job that they had two different names for yak manure. Uh, when it first comes out of the yak, they call it miyak and you have to use tools to handle it. You don't touch it with your hands. Later, after it's dried, they call it argazin, and it's considered sanitary. You can bring it inside the yurt and uh, burn it in the stove to boil tea. So through this very humble task, I began to discover the richness of the lexicon. Now, one of the dilemmas that I had in my stay in Tuva was learning to say go. I thought that I should learn this verb on the very first day. It's a pretty basic verb. Anytime you learn a language, you need to learn how to say go. But in Tuvan, they actually have five different words for go. And I was confused. And so I would try different words and people would either laugh at me or they would correct me, but they couldn't explain to me what the system was. It turns out that if you want to say go in Tuvan, you have to know something about the landscape. First, you have to know where the nearest river is. Now, the river might be out of sight. It might be far away from you, but you still have to know where it is. Secondly, you have to know what direction is the current flowing in the river. That's very important. And thirdly, you have to know what is your trajectory, your path relative to the river current. Are you traveling with the river current, against the river current, or across the river current? Finally, you can add information about whether you're going on foot or by some means of transportation like a motorcycle or a camel. And using that matrix of information, you can arrive at the correct word for go for any situation. It took me a while to learn this, and it's a very complex system, but it shows how the language is connected to the landscape. Now, if you are going on a journey in Tuva, it is customary to consult a shamaness or a shaman who will augur the future and will tell you, is this an auspicious day for traveling or should you stay home instead? So I had many conversations with shamans and shamanesses in Tuva. They are respected practitioners. Many people consult them for problems, for health, for spiritual matters. And I noticed in talking to the shamans, they had 
what seemed to me like an unusual way of talking about time. When they talked about the past, they used words, metaphors relating to the nose and the forehead. And when they talked about the future, they used a different set of metaphors relating to the scapula, to the spine, to the back. It took me a while to figure this out, but Tuvans think about the past as being situated in front of them, where they can see it. The past is obvious, it's clear. The future, by contrast, is hidden. It's sneaking up behind you. You can never see it. It's going to surprise you. And so they have taken the space-time metaphor that's so familiar to us, and they have reversed it. And that's how they think about the past and the future. My host family in Tuva, this is a picture of them, they spent much of their day caring for goats, which are their livelihood, their source of wealth, their bank account. And so I spent a lot of time with the goats. And as a result, I began to learn the taxonomy, the lexicon of goats. So I'd like to play for you a very short video clip where two of my teachers are teaching me some of the 24 different names that they have in Tuvan that describe colors and patterns of goats. So what's impressive about this system, it's not just a list of 24 names, it's a taxonomy. It's also a technology. It allows a goat herder to look out at their herd of goats and very efficiently pick out a particular goat based on some characteristics that it has. And this is a survival tool for them in this very harsh environment where they live. I was able to do a lot with the data that I collected in Tuva. I was able to write my dissertation uh, for Yale University to get my PhD in linguistics. I was able to write a dictionary and a grammar of the language, but these things were of very little interest to the community. And so I wanted to do something more than just publish academic products that were not helpful to the community. And I decided to embark on really what has now been a 20 year journey for me, which is helping small language communities sustain their languages. So the lessons that I learned from living with the nomads in Tuva, which was a very humbling and yet transformative experience for me, was that language is not, as we're taught in linguistics, contained within the brain. It's something much greater, it's much larger. And living with the nomads helped me appreciate how languages are, languages are connected to land, to landscapes, to rivers, to mountains, to goats, things like that. So a crucial lesson for me is that language is not just a cognitive phenomenon. It's not just something that we think or, or perform in our brains. Actually, it spills out of the brain, it spills out of the head, and it is capacious. It encompasses not just grammar, but landscapes, goats, rivers, plants, metaphors, time, and space. It's so rich, and it presents a completely alternative worldview to the one that we may be familiar with. It's also a vast environmental knowledge base, and one that is eroding and vanishing, but can only be accessed within these languages. This is the connection I mentioned earlier between language diversity and species diversity. So we've been in Siberia in a remote part of the world. We're now going to move to another language hotspot in the South Pacific, a place where I have been working for the past five years, the South Pacific island nation of Vanuatu. Vanuatu is a small archipelago in the South Pacific. It has a population of 250,000 people, but it is also the number one language hotspot in the world. What do I mean by that? Well, I said that language hotspots have a high density of languages. And indeed, Vanuatu, with only 250,000 people, has 113 languages. This is an astonishing amount of language diversity. I've spent many hours working with local communities on different islands in Vanuatu. This is a scene on Futuna Island, working with experts 
to create talking dictionaries for these languages and to share their knowledge. And I want to share a little bit with you of what they have shared with me. This is a typical scene. So they live off of the sea and off of their small gardens where they grow vegetables. And so this is a very typical scene where uh, two friends of mine, Orion and Chris, have been out fishing in the lagoon. And they come in with their canoe and they show me what they have harvested from the sea. So I'll play this clip for you. <laughs> what did you catch today? Uh, clams. Can you tell me the name and language? Nizubo, Nizubo. Uh, Niri? Niri, yeah. Yeah, this one's Niri. And... Uh, Nizubo. Niri, Nizubo. Nizubo? Nithubo. Troka, you remember? Troka? Uh, Nithubo. And... Troka, the one. What is my Morris? Here are the other one. Uh, in Horis? In Horis. In Horis. So those are just three of the shellfish that my friend Orion was able to identify and that he had caught out fishing in the lagoon. And it's not uncommon. In fact, it's quite typical for expert fishermen like this man, his name is Anselon Seru, to be able to name and identify 250 different species of fish. And this is an astonishing knowledge base about the natural world and it surpasses what um, scientists know about this environment. Now, fishing is really the life support of this entire island, this entire village. And so they have special rituals and songs connected with fishing activities. For example, a tuna fish is considered the most prized, the most celebrated fish that they can catch. And so when the fishermen catch a tuna fish, they have a special song and dance ritual that they perform. And I'm, I'd like to play a little clip of that for you. The song actually begins when they're still out in their canoes out at sea. They sing the first part of it. And then the second part of it is sung when they arrive on the beach and they unload the tuna fish from their boats. And I would like to play a little bit of this tuna fish celebratory song and dance performed by the people of Futuna Island. So the next time you eat a fish, you can think about this joyful song and dance celebration of the people of Futuna Island and what it means to them. Now they continue singing this song as they leave the beach and they carry the fish up to the village where people are preparing to eat it. And the irony here is that the fishermen, so this man, Anselon Seru, who caught the fish <clears throat> will not be allowed to eat it, not even a single bite of it. There is a strict taboo, and the fishermen who catch the fish are not allowed to eat the tuna fish. They can only eat the smaller, 
more bony, less, less tasty fish, even though they have provided this food for the whole community. So what happens if you're a fisherman and you've just caught a beautiful tuna fish, but you're not allowed to eat it? You have to watch other people in the village eating that fish. Well, for Ancelone, he has a digital solution to this. He takes a photo of the fish and he puts it on his Instagram feed. That's right. This remote island in the South Pacific is connected to the global information network and they use social media to share their culture. It's really quite remarkable. I sat down with some of the navigators, the sailors, the men of Futuna who spend many, many hours out. And I asked them, how can you sail miles and miles away from your island out into the ocean so that the island is completely out of sight over the horizon, and yet you always manage to find your way home? And they explained to me they have a technology called a wind compass. So we sat down with one of the elders. The younger men did not fully know this system. It, it's in the process of being forgotten, but one of the elders knew it. And we sat down together and we sketched out this beautiful drawing, which shows the names of 17 different winds that blow around Futuna Island. And as an expert navigator, if you learn this system, you learn to sense the winds with your body, you learn the names of the winds, you learn the directions in which they blow, you are never lost on the ocean and you can always find your way back home to your island. So this again is a linguistic technology. It's a unique worldview that is found only in this language. And it represents an adaptation and a survival strategy for living on this island. Many of the fish names that Ancelone shared with me, and he knew more than 250 of them, have become part of the Futuna Talking Dictionary, which I've created along with this community. In addition, one of the challenges that people face in this community is cyclones. And whenever a cyclone hits, everyone knows that the newly constructed buildings, which are made of uh, boards and tin and sometimes even cement, are not going to survive the cyclone. And so everyone goes into the traditional houses, which are made entirely of plants with no nails, no metal. And they know that this is how to survive a cyclone. On one of our trips, we asked a community, and we spent about a week filming a documentary film, we asked them, to show us how to build a cyclone house. And this was a very intricate process. It, it involved almost every member of the community. Some people had to go out into the jungle to collect specific plants. Other people had to process these plants, for example, by roasting them over a fire. Other people had to build the construction. And there were more than 40 plants used in the construction of this cyclone house. In addition, as we talked to the elders, we found that the knowledgeable elders could name 2,000 plants that grow on their island. And the botanists who were with me on this expedition were astounded because about half of those 2,000 plants that the experts could name are not yet known to botanical science. They lack scientific names. They have not been scientifically identified. And yet 40 of these plants are used in the construction of a cyclone house. And every one of these plants are well known to local people for their properties, for their medicines, their healing qualities, and so forth. So lessons I learned from Vanuatu, this very small group of islands in the South Pacific, the number one language hotspot, is that there is a very rich knowledge base about the environment. And that this is found only in small local languages and it supports both biodiversity on land and at sea and sustainability. Well, we've been to two language hotspots. We were in Siberia and we were in Vanuatu in the South Pacific. And so I would like to come now back to a place that is much closer to home for many of you, many of you uh, which is Colombia, which is also part of a language hotspot. Colombia has an astonishing richness of languages and cultures. Uh, approximately 50 million people in Colombia, and they speak in 90 languages. 
Now here is a map from the ethnologue and you won't be able to see the small print on this map, but I would like to draw your attention to the color blocks on this map. Each color represents not a language, not a single language, but in fact, an entire family of languages. So you see the orange and the blue and the pink and the green and the brown, each one of these represents a family of related languages. And if we count up all the languages of Colombia, we have 90 languages. Currently, three of these languages have been declared extinct. 87 of them are living. And of the 87 living languages, 81 of those are indigenous. That means that they are spoken natively in Colombia and almost nowhere else. And six of them are non-Indigenous, so that would include Spanish, English languages uh, that represent um, diaspora communities, global languages. Astonishing richness, and this, it has been my great joy and privilege to come to Colombia on several occasions and to explore this linguistic diversity and to learn from your experts. I've met some remarkable people like Pastor Chasoy Agreda, who is a speaker of Ingua. Ingua is a highland language spoken up in the mountains. I believe it has approximately 18 or 20,000 speakers. It is under some pressure and it is beginning to be an endangered language. Uh, I was able to interview uh, Pablo Guerra Lopez. He is a speaker of Guajira, also known as Wayu. Uh, Wayu is, uh, has a couple hundred thousand speakers, and it is considered to be one of the healthiest languages in terms of preservation. I also met a really remarkable person, uh, this man, Luis Misael Socaras Ipuana. Now, he is a member of the Wayu people who live in the north, uh, also across the border in Venezuela. In fact, the Wayu people don't recognize the Colombia-Venezuela border because it is, it's bisects their traditional homeland and they live on both sides of it. Uh, Luis is an expert orator and he is uh, called a puchipui is his title. In Spanish, you could roughly translate this as palabrero. In English, it doesn't really have a translation, but he is an expert in oratorical conflict resolution and traditional law. So when there is a dispute, between individuals or between families, they bring this matter to him and he applies principles of traditional law. He gives an oratorical speech. He weighs the conflicting claims and he may decide on compensation to be paid by one side to the other, thus restoring social harmony and preventing conflict. And so he is a wise man. He is uh, a judge, he is a person who carries the traditions and his power resides in his words and his ability to command the words and the language. So this is a remarkable thing. When I met Luis, one of the first things I asked him was, how do you say hello in Wayu, Wayu Nike, which is the name of the language, or how do you greet someone in Wayu Nike? And Luis explained to me that when one Wayu person greets another, they say, Jamaya Pu La Puin. Jamaya Pu La Puin. And this translates as, How was your dream? How was your dream? Dreams are so central to the Wayu way of life, and they express a Wayu mythic cosmovision, what you, you say in Spanish, cosmovisión mítica. Now, the modern Western mentality tries to separate the mythical and the religious from rational or scientific ways of thinking. The Wayu people, by contrast, unify these two modes of thinking. According to the Wayu writer, Jose Angel Fernandez, he writes, quote, the Wayu live by dreaming and ritualizing, which allows us to express behaviors and attitudes that nourish the magical religious world of the Wayu every day. The why you constantly intertwine the everyday with the magical. According to another why you writer, Ramon Paz Ipuana, the why you quote, cultivate collective memory, starting with the ancestors, recording primordial origins, 
The spirit of this memory is reflected in the mirrors of time that stretch back into the past, flow into the present, and project into the future, end quote. This Wayu Cosmovision constantly interweaves the future and the present. And this is why dreams are so important. And this is why when one Wayu person greets another, they ask, have you had a dream? They believe that the ancestors visit them in dreams. Dreams are the pathway, the communicating vessel through which the spirits of deceased ancestors establishes spiritual contact with family, friends, and enemies. Now, this powerful mythical cosmovision of the Wayu people is, is not isolated to them. In fact, it's world famous and it is known to the world through your most famous and celebrated Colombian, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who introduced his magical realism genre to the world, achieved worldwide renown, and of course, won the Nobel Prize for Literature. This is of course, standard reading, but not only in Colombia. Every high school student in Canada, in the United States, is familiar with and is exposed to the works of Garcia Marquez. He is truly a global luminary. Uh, but much of his inspiration and his magical realism, in fact, comes from the Wayu Cosmovision. Um, it's known he was raised in a Wayu cultural setting and he understood the language. He was raised by a grandmother who was part Wayu, who spoke the language. He was raised by caretakers who spoke to him in the language. And even as an adult, he remembered many of these phrases and stories from the language and wrote about it. His grandmother was an especial inspiration to him and she practiced a magical style of oral storytelling. He writes in his autobiography that she, quote, inserted extraordinary events and anomalies as if they were simply an aspect of everyday life, end quote. He described her as, quote, the source of a magical, superstitious, and supernatural view of reality, end quote. So this transculturation of ideas from the Wayu language, from the Wayu cosmovision into Spanish through the works of Garcia Marquez, and then to the rest of the world in translation is one of the great examples of how language contact and language learning can provide a portal into other worlds. Anyone who reads the novels of Garcia Marquez benefits from being exposed to Wayu cultural ideas, even if they know nothing about it or have no direct contact. Another activity of mine in Colombia was working with the Smithsonian Institution, which is our national museum, to invite a delegation of cultural experts from Colombia to Washington, DC, where they shared their culture with a million visitors over 10 days at this important cultural festival. One of the most striking performances that they gave at that festival was the Wayu dance called the Yonna, also called the Chichimaya, this dance expresses deep Wayu cultural values. It expresses relations between the genders. It can serve as a kind of a courtship dance, but it also has a spiritual dimension in that it works for the improvement of relation between human beings and spiritual forces, such as the rain god, which the Wayu believe influences the weather. Another activity that I was able to lead in Colombia at the Institute Caro y Cuervo in Bogota was a workshop for talking dictionaries. And I worked with six different indigenous minority languages of Colombia, including the Wayu community and the Paez or the Naseyue community to create a series of talking dictionaries for indigenous languages of Colombia. And I invite you to visit my site, talkingdictionary.com to see more of these. It was also my great honor and privilege to have my book, When Languages Die, which is where I talk about this work and I talk about the wonderful language warriors that I've met around the world and how they are saving their languages. Uh, this book was wonderfully translated uh, by the University of the Andes and published in Colombia. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity to reach a new readership for this work.
So lessons that I learned from Colombia is that oral traditions are alive and well. Uh, we think that writing is central and most important to language, but most of the world's languages do not make use of writing and still have very powerful oral traditions which exercise their memory in phenomenal ways. And they have an ability to memorize and transmit vast bodies of knowledge without making any use of writing. Another lesson from Colombia is that this is not only literature we're talking about, but entire dreamscapes, cosmovision, as I said, ritual legal systems, and ideas about right relations between humans and the environment, sustainability. Now, these ideas are, are only accessible directly within the language, but they can be transculturated for speakers of other languages to benefit from them. And this is the example I gave of the works of Garcia Marquez, which embodies many YU cultural values within it. Now, you may wonder how all of this relates to the English language classroom and why uh, I'm speaking about minority and indigenous languages at a conference of English language teachers. I said at the beginning, I want to thank you for the vital work that you are doing. You are giving your students the gift of being bilingual. And this is an amazing thing that will open so many doors for them. It will give them access to many, many minority cultures around the world for which English is the contact language in the same way that Spanish in Colombia gives access to 89 other cultures and languages. Uh, you are adding to their linguistic repertoire. You are expanding their minds and their worldview. And this is something that will stay with them for the rest of their life and will be transformative. So I want once again to thank all of you for the amazing work that you are doing in helping your students access other worlds and other worldviews and other cultures, even beyond English speaking culture, um, in the work that you are doing and all of your. ELT classrooms in Colombia. I'll just close by saying thank you. And we're going to have a Q&A session, I believe, next. If you'd like to know more, um, you can take a look at my book, The Last Speakers, which was published by National Geographic. Thank you so much.